Hey, this is Arthur Hill, Senior Technical Analyst with StockCharts.com. It is Tuesday, April 9th, and you're tuned in to a special edition of On Trend. I'm actually on vacation at the moment, but this is a pre-recorded series on using RSI for trend following and momentum strategies. This is part one, and you can see part two on Thursday. So we're going to start off with reasons to use trend following and momentum strategies, and then we'll go into why RSI is a great indicator for trend following and momentum. We'll review RSI range and momentum signals. We'll look at the key levels for RSI, and I'll show you how to scan for stocks with strong uptrends. You can also check the Arts Charts commentary for Monday, April 8th, and there you will find links as well as some scan code on these trend following and momentum strategies. So why would we want to use a trend following strategy? Well, for one thing, trend following has shown a propensity to work over time. Trend following is also known as time series momentum or absolute momentum. It means if something is going up, it tends to keep going up. Or if something is going down, it tends to keep going down. A trend in motion stays in motion. Now, keep in mind, we're dealing with probabilities here, okay? The probability is that if there is an uptrend, you have a better chance of making money than if a stock is, say, in a downtrend. Now, don't take my word for it. There have been a number of studies and academic papers supporting trend following. There's a paper by Ian D'Souza and his colleagues, and they note that the existence of time series stock momentum has been a persistent phenomena in the U.S. equity markets throughout the 88-year period since 1927. It doesn't work every month, and maybe there will be periods when it doesn't work, but over time, trend following shows a propensity to work. There's also another paper by Georgiopoulou and Wang, The Trend is Your Friend, a very appropriate title, but they looked at time series momentum across equity and commodity markets. And their paper documented that there was a significant time series momentum effect that is consistent and robust across all examined conventional asset classes from 1969 to 2015. So in charting terms, just using a simple 200-day moving average, this is suggesting this theory of trend following that you have a much better chance of making gains by picking stocks that are above their 200-day moving average and avoiding stocks that are below their 200-day moving average. So that could be your first filter, so to speak. Of course, when it comes to stocks, there is another factor at work that helps produce winners, and that is momentum, relative momentum. And the theory behind that is that the winners continue to win or outperform. And you can see this picture here. This is, of course, Boston and the New England Patriots. And this picture dates before the Super Bowl in 2019. And you wouldn't bet against the Patriots because they win and winners have a better chance of continuing to win. And of course, there are numerous academic papers on momentum and momentum effect in the stock market. This is a paper from Yagadish and Titman, and it shows that stocks that have outperformed over three to 12 month time horizons continue to outperform during their testing. Now, they updated this paper in 2011, and the updated paper showed that this momentum strategy still worked on U.S. stocks overall, but it did suffer a setback in 2009. Nothing is going to be perfect. So what this study is suggesting is that if you look at momentum and you sort by six-month momentum, which would be the rate of change, that these stocks that are up the most here have a much better chance of outperforming the stocks that are down the most. And these are the stocks that are down the most. So what if we combine trend following and momentum? Well, that's pretty much been done. Gary Antonacci wrote a book, Dual Momentum Investing, a few years ago. And basically, it's looking for stocks that are in uptrends with good momentum. There's a quote from Richard Dryhouse. He says, I try to buy stocks that have already had good price moves, that are already making new highs, and that have positive relative strength. And there is where the edge is in the stock market. 
So finding stocks in uptrends with good momentum is the edge. And how are we going to find that edge? Well, I think we can do it using RSI. And that is, of course, the Relative Strength Index, which was created by J. Wells Wilder Jr. and introduced in his 1978 book, New Concepts in Technical Trading Systems. Now, Wilder used classic RSI, as I'll call it, to identify turning points, uh, use overbought when above 70 to identify a potential downturn, use oversold when below 30 to identify a potential upturn, and Wilder also used divergences and failure swings. Now, I'll just recap a few of these classic signals from his book. Uh, you can see here that there's RSI moving above 70 and turning down, and you got a little bit of a pullback in the stock here, Visa. And then you see we have a higher high in price and a lower high in RSI. So that's a bearish divergence. Uh, didn't give much of a signal there for a decline. And then we had what's called a bearish failure swing here in August, September, October, where you have RSI moving above 70. You have a lower high in RSI and it doesn't go above 70 on that bounce. And then to confirm that failure swing, you move below the prior low in RSI there. So that failure swing was confirmed in October. And keep in mind that the failure swing is independent of price. Wilder just looked at RSI to identify a failure swing. Above 70, pullback, bounce that does not get above 70, and then a break below the intermittent low. Now it also happens to be a bearish divergence because you have a higher high in Visa and a lower high in RSI. Here's a chart of synopsis, and there you can see RSI moving above 70 and a little bit of a pullback in the stock after that. We can also see a bearish divergence with a higher high in the stock and a lower high in RSI and a bearish failure swing because RSI went on to break below that prior low. See, it didn't get above 70 there. It didn't result in much weakness because the stock went to a new high there in August and September. So we got overbought again and came down. We got oversold below 30 and that gave way to a little bit of a bounce. And then we had a big bullish divergence because you had a lower low in the stock price and a higher low in RSI. And you can see that that led to a quite a nice advance in January, February. It was also a bullish failure swing, which is, of course, the opposite of a bearish failure swing. So you have a move below 30 and a bounce, and you have a pullback in RSI, and that pullback holds above 30, and then you break above the intermittent high there for a breakout in RSI. And it is also independent of price. Now, just a word of caution on divergences. They don't work all the time, all right? If you get a strong uptrend, you're going to see bearish divergences and they're not going to work. Same with a strong downtrend. You're going to see bullish divergences that do not work. Also note that I'm using 14 period RSI and that works different than say five period RSI, which is more of a mean reversion indicator. I think 14 period RSI is better for the trend following indicator that I'll get into in a little bit here. But as you can see in this S&P 500 chart, you know, we had a nice bullish divergence failure swing there in January, February that gave way to a good bounce. But then we had a bearish divergence and not much of a decline sideways. We had another bearish divergence and not much of a decline. And then we had a bearish divergence in December, January, and that didn't lead to much. And so you moved higher actually. And we had another bearish divergence from February to May and the S&P moved to a new high. So be very careful with the diverg these divergences because the signals are not that great, I don't think. So why can RSI be used as a trend following and momentum indicator? Well, in order to understand that, we have to break down RSI and understand what makes RSI tick. So when you break down RSI, it's composed of first the average gain and the average loss. And the average gain is the sum of the gains over 14 days divided by 14. And the average loss is the sum of the losses over 14 days divided by 14. Then you have RS, and that is the average gain divided by the average loss. So right there, you can see that when RS is above one, 
the average gain is greater than the average loss. That means prices are moving higher. When RS is below one, the average gain is less than the average loss, and that means prices are moving lower. And when you translate that to RSI, when RSI is above 50, RS is above one. All right, when RSI is below 50, RS is below one. So you know when RSI is above 50, prices are moving higher. That's a key level. And when RSI is below 50, prices are moving lower in general. So don't glaze over here. This is just a little sample calculation from a spreadsheet on RSI, and we're using Biogen. And there you can see the first 14 days. There's the average gain. So even though there are nine gains here, you add them all up and you divide by 14 to get the average gain. And then you have the losses here. And there are five losses and you add them all up and you divide by 14 to get the average loss. And then you get RS and you can see RS is well above one, 2.38. And consequently RSI is above 70. So that shows you that prices are moving higher RS is above one, RSI is above 70. So you look at the table here and you can see that RS is continually above one and uh, sometimes above two, and RSI is well above 50. But then something happened there and you can see that RS moved below one and that meant the average gain was less than the average loss. Prices were moving lower. And so RS went continually below one and RSI was continually below 50. And you can see here that it got down to the low 30s. So here's a chart example. It's a different time period, but here is Biogen. You can see prices are moving higher. And then RSI is mostly above 50. A couple days there, below 50 just a bit, but mostly above 50. And then you had a shift there in February when RSI moved below 50 and remained below 50 with numerous readings below 30. And you can see prices are trending lower during this time period. So RSI, when you break it down, is clearly an indicator that can tell you the direction of the trend. The cup is half full when RSI is above 50, prices are generally moving higher, and the cup is half empty when RSI is below 50, prices are moving lower. The further above 50 RSI is, the stronger that upward price action and the stronger that upward momentum. The further below 50, the stronger the decline. So you can think of 50 in RSI as like the 50-yard line in football. You know, a team kicks off and they get the ball at, say, the 20-yard line, and they start driving. And as long as they're not past the 50, they're not really a threat, all right? They're not in an uptrend. But once they cross 50, they're starting to get closer to the goal line, and they get to, the say, the 30-yard line. Well, now they're in field goal range. And so when they move closer to that goal line, that's a sign of stronger momentum. So think of RSI as like the 50-yard line in football. Now, there are, of course, a couple more steps in the RSI formula, and I'll just briefly touch on those. You have the smoothing that Wilder used. He took the previous average gain, multiplied it by 13, added the current gain, and divided by 14. And he did the same with the previous average loss. Now, he also normalized the indicator, and this is a very important step because it does two things. The normalization process makes RSI values comparable, not just internally, but externally. And there's a formula you can see for normalization. But by normalizing RSI, you can compare a current RSI value with previous RSI values because it is floating within a range, 0 to 100. But you can also compare an RSI value from one stock to another because of this normalization process. Now, there are also some theories out there on RSI ranges. Andrew Cardwell of Cardwell RSI Edge put out a theory that RSI trades in a bull range from 40 to 80 and typically holds the 40 to 50 zone in an uptrend. It also has a bear range from, say, 20 to 60. And then the 50 to 60 zone acts as resistance. Also, you have Constance Brown in her book, Technical Analysis for the Trading Professional. 
She put her bull range at 40 to 90 and her bear range from 20 to 65. So here's an example of a bull range from 40 to 80, Illumina, the biotech stock. You can see prices are clearly trending higher there from February to September. And RSI is trading in that 40 to 80 range. It doesn't go below 40 until October there. And here's Borg Warner with an example of a bear range for RSI. You can see the stock trending lower there. And you can see RSI trades in that 20 to 60 range the entire time. There is a brief, de brief excursion above 60, but it didn't hold. But for the most part, you can see that RSI is in the lower part of its 0 to 100 range. Now, there are also some theories out there on RSI being a momentum indicator to buy when it's overbought. There's a there is an article from Active Trader Magazine years ago called RSI is Wrong. And it was buying when above 75 and selling when below 25. And this article was quoted in the book by Julie Dahlquist and Charles Kirkpatrick, Technical Analysis, the Complete Resource for Market Technicians. And then there's also a presentation from David Cox, a chartered market technician. And he showed how you can use a surge from below 30 to above 70 to show a sudden shift in the momentum dynamics that is bullish. So here's an example that Cox used in his presentation. It is Apple, Apple Computer, Apple Incorporated. And you can see that Apple was trending lower here into April and RSI was consistently moving below 30 in a downtrend, clearly. And then we had this surge from well below 30 to well above 70 suddenly from late June to early August. And that showed a sudden shift in the momentum dynamics and the beginning of a nice upswing for Apple. Here's another one that I found. It is Eversource Energy. And you can see it was trending down in the first part of 2018 and RSI was moving below 30. And then you had that big surge from well below 30 to well above 70. And that signaled a power shift in momentum going from a strong downtrend to a strong uptrend. And that momentum carried through as the stock continued higher after that initial momentum surge. So, you know, just how rare are moves above 70 or say below 30? Well, I went back and I looked at stocks in the S&P 500 over a 20-year period. And I looked at the daily RSI values for these 500 stocks. And I used historical constituents over this time frame. So the stocks that were in the index, say, in 2003 were the ones that were tested, not the stocks that are just in the index now. And I looked at all RSI values. Now, keep in mind, during this period, the S&P 500 was up substantially. It was up the total return S&P 500 was up like 250% which is a 6.4% compound annual return. And the RSI values reflected that upward bias in the S&P 500. So over 50% of RSI values were above 50. Conversely, less than 50% of RSI values were below 50. And just 6.2% of RSI values were above 70. So if you're picking stocks that have the ability to get above 70 for their 14 period RSI, they're, they're in the elite category. And on the downside, just 3.5% of RSI values were below 30. And here's what this looks like in an Excel table here. You can see a bit of a bell curve shape to it. And there you can see 56.7% of all the RSI values were above 50, a clear upward bias during this 20 year period and 43.3% were below. And then you look at corresponding levels, RSI 45, 28% were below 45%, whereas conversely 40.9% were above 55 and the same with 40 and 60. And then you get to that 70 level, 6.2% above 70 and just 3.5% below 30. 
So what do we know so far? Well, we know that prices are generally moving higher when RSI is above 50. And the further above 50 RSI is, the stronger the uptrend. Furthermore, we know that RSI values above 70 are relatively rare. And when you get above 70, that is showing strong momentum, which is something we want to pay attention to. And finally, RSI values are comparable externally and internally. So we can compare RSI values across a time frame for a particular stock, or we can compare RSI values from one stock to another. And so let's dive into that a little bit. So here's a chart for Abbott Laboratories, ABT, and we can see a nice uptrend there from May until February. And during this uptrend, RSI is moving above 70 on a regular basis. And not once does it move below 30 or become oversold. Now, we do see some spikes below 40. So that RSI bull range, it's not a perfect indicator, but it's just something that can give us an idea of the general trend. Furthermore, when we look at the RSI value on an absolute basis, it's at 57.65. And now let's compare that to another stock. So here's ABV over the same time period. And you can see that RSI was doing very good, moving above 70 on a regular basis and holding above that 40 level for the most part. And price was moving higher. But then something changed in March when you moved below 30 with RSI and you had a couple dips below 30 and you stopped moving above 70. So you had two things happen here. You had increasing downside momentum and then on the bounces, the upside momentum was not that strong and you can see prices were trending lower. And then you can see the absolute value for RSI on the ending date is 36.19. And now when we put these two side by side, there you can see ABV with those RSI readings below 30 and failing to get above 70. And then you can see Abbott Laboratories continues to move above 70 for RSI and does not move below 30. So right away you can see that Abbott is going to be preferred over ABV. And then you see the absolute value 36.91 versus 57.65. So when you're using a trend following or a momentum strategy or something that is using trend following and momentum, dual momentum, you're usually relying on some big winners to take care of the losers. You know, you're going to have at best a 50% win rate, probably more like a 40% win rate and 60% are going to be losers, but you're going to get those big winners that are going to take care of those losers. That's a typical trend following momentum type strategy. And so with that in mind, we want to try and focus on the stocks that have the potential to be big winners with consistent and persistent uptrends. And we can use RSI to find trends that are consistent and persistent. And on the consistency basis, we're looking for RSI to hold a certain threshold on the downside. So if you look at Boeing here, this is an ideal stock because you can see that RSI did not dip below 40 from October 2016 until March 2018. So for well over a year, RSI was above 40. It held that 40 to 50 zone on a regular basis. And then look at how often it moved above 70. So you had consistency in that the dips were contained and you had persistency in that RSI kept moving above 70. That was strong momentum. And then you look at the price chart and this is one of the best uptrends of that period. And so you need to own a stock like this in order to have a profitable trend following or momentum based portfolio. Now, as we know, theory is one thing and reality is another. So this is an example of Valero that had a really good run during that same time frame. But you can see during this time frame, it had a period when RSI moved to 30. It didn't go below 30 as the stock traded pretty much flat to slightly down. And it didn't get above 70 during that period. And then when it got back above 70, momentum was picking 
back up and you can see the stock had a really nice run. And then we had RSI dip below 40, so it wasn't the ideal pullback, but you can see that it held above 40 again in March there and the stock broke out with new highs. So in general, when you're not going below 30, you're not showing that much downside momentum, but ideally you would want a stock that is going to hold that 40 area for RSI. Here's another one, MasterCard. This is another great stable uptrend. It was consistent. You can see RSI dip below 40 a couple of times, but for the most part held that 40 to 50 zone. So the trend was consistent in that the pullbacks were contained and then it was persistent because RSI kept moving above 70 on a regular basis. And look at that trend. We need stocks like this in our portfolios in order to have a net gain at the end of the month or quarter or year. And here is Arthur Gallagher, an insurance stock. And you can see there is just one steady uptrend, higher highs and higher lows. RSI does pierce that 40 level and gets below 30. But once it gets back above 70, we put it back in the cup is half full. It's got momentum. And then you can see it pierces 40, but holds it for the most part. Again, pierces 40, but holds it for the most part. So keep in mind, though, even if it's piercing 40 and getting down to the 35 area, as long as you have these consistent moves above 70 on the upside and you're making higher highs, because when you're moving above 70 with RSI, you're usually making higher highs on the price chart. And that's what we want. So as far as an overall strategy is concerned, we're using this trend and momentum combination to separate out stocks that are contenders from the pretenders. And we're going to probably whittle down the universe to a, a select few, you know, maybe 10%, maybe 20%, but no more than 20%. So you're going to have a, a subset to work with of stocks to look for potential setups. And you're going to have a little bit more of an edge because you're going to have trend and momentum on your side. Here is Illumina again. And look at that in January 2017 from oversold to overbought, way overbought. And short term, it did move sideways to consolidate those gains. But after becoming overbought with that initial move above 70, even 80, it more than doubled and continued higher on a steady basis with regular moves above 70. We had a brief dip to 30, but right back up and right back above 70 to continue that uptrend. And this is the kind of stable, persistent uptrend that we want to capture. So there's a very simple scan that you can use to find stocks with consistent and persistent uptrends. Here I've got the group is the S&P 500 and we're using the min function there. So the minimum value, and I just chose 75 days here of RSI 14 is above 35. So it didn't dip below 35. And then I want the maximum value over that 75 day period for RSI to go above 69. I could choose 70, but I gave it a little bit of a buffer. And then I'm going to choose rank by to rank the results by 14 period RSI. And if you run that scan, you will see stocks that are holding up quite well with consistent and persistent uptrends over at least a 75 day period. And there you have it, RSI for trend following and momentum strategies. Be sure to check the Arch Charts commentary for Monday, April 8th for some links and the scan criteria. Thanks a lot for tuning in and have a great day.